Imagine for a moment you're in a draft. Things are going well. You've taken a rare, a solid rare, nothing special, but a, a solid card in a deck. And then you take another couple of cards, just taking the best card in every pack. You're just sort of a couple of, you know, your four or five picks deep. You have mostly cards in two colors. And, you know, you're, you're wondering, you're figuring out where you're going to be going in this draft. And you find yourself here, for example. In this image, we see the problem that I like to describe, the five mana signpost problem at its foremost display. We have the choice in this situation between a two mana spell and the five mana signpost on common of the deck we're hoping to draft. It would be difficult from this spot to conclude that we should not be drafting black white. But if we are to be drafting black white, which of these cards is better? I think there is a clear answer to that in this particular case. But more philosophically, what does it mean when your, fi when your archetype has a 5-mana signpost uncommon as opposed to a cheaper signpost uncommon in any variety? What does it mean for draft strategy? What does it mean for gameplay? What does it mean in terms of your philosophy and how often you should be drafting that archetype? All these complications will be explored today as I take a deep dive into what I call the 5-mana signpost problem. I wanted to begin this video by addressing some of potential concerns about this the five mana signpost problem, what does it mean, you know, all those kinds of things. So I'm gonna take a little bit to go over some of the overview thoughts before I get a little bit deeper into it. So things you might be thinking. Five mana cards are worse than cheaper cards, so what? I already know that. I've never misevaluated a card in my life. These cards are not bad. The person presenting the video is bad. These are all concerns that have come up over the course of, you know, my my uh, my presentation, right? Like people people might think these things, and this is these are things that I have to address within the context of this video. The another common concern is carbon rates are not representative of my decks. Again, we will we will address these concerns momentarily, and also the final concern that you might have is. Bortok Bone Rattle is on this, this slide, and I like Bortok Bone Rattle. We, we both like Bortok Bone Rattle, okay? And this this is not really, this video is not really about Bortok Bone Rattle, but the concern has been noted that, that Bortok Bone Rattle well liked, with, well respected within the community. So, how am I going to address these concerns? I've changed to, to Colossal Sky Turtle, okay? Another expensive card, also not 5 mana, by the way, but the, the 5 mana problem applies to more expensive cards as well. And I use top player data when available. So there are a couple of formats I've played that top data player doesn't data didn't exist really. I think AFR. Oh, well, I don't really count AFR. At Midnight Hunt and Crimson Vow were the two that come to mind that don't really have it. Um, when when it when it makes sense and it's available, I use that as sort of a baseline. And I'm um, I also played all these formats. Um, I was a I was a I am somebody that is considered a top player. Obviously, like there's no way of knowing that for sure, but my win rate's been above 60% for a very long time, and ex with the exception of Phyrexia Albi 1, where it dipped to like 55 or something. I don't know. It was that was that was a nightmare. Um, that was a nightmare. But other than that, I think it's been 60 over 60% for a very long time at this point, and so I I do have at least a little bit of an authority on how good these cards were, even in niche scenarios. And this is a little bit of my perspective, right? This is not necessarily meant to be the most objective thing about of all time. My videos, for the most part, are meant to catalog how I think about the game, my perspective on things. There are obviously, like, I'm obviously not perfect. There's nobody that's perfect. Um, so it is, there is always room for development, but I think that I certainly have at least, at least somewhat of an authority to speak on this. And also the the point of the video is not really necessarily super gameplay focused. It's sort of meant as a philosophy philosophy thing about drafting and what it means to draft in like modern limited with uh, with more expensive signposts on commons in mind. With that out of the way, I want to begin by first going over all the five mana signposts on commons we have from the past like three years or so since I've been you know playing. Honor Eater, since I've been back, really, playing more at a more competitive level. Um, and I wanted to, there's five classes of, of five drops. And first, I wanted to discuss 
the success stories. These cards, in my opinion, are strong, genuinely strong, five minute signposts on commons that were successful at doing their job. They were good. They were active reasons to get into the color pair. It didn't matter that they were five mana. You could take them early. Hero of the Dunes is a little bit of an outlier. I was actually kind of surprised to see it up here, but its stats in Brothers War indicate that it should be on the list, and so I have put it on the list for that. Re put it on the list for that reason. Um, the one thing you'll notice about these cards is that almost all of them are an immediate two for one. Uh, Titan's Vanguard is the only one that is not, and that is kind of a little bit disingenuous because it was so easy to make Eldrazi in the set that it um it it was a two for one a lot of the time when it and it was like an immediate it was a persistent threat right. Um, the rest of these cards immediately do to, like either trade for two of your opponent's resources or uh, make two bodies. So th they're just that that's kind of your template for a, a strong, strong five minute card. A good reason to actually get into a deck. Um, they are also all above rate. Again, the Mouth of Sauron, you could argue not always, but pretty much always in blue black in that set, you were able to make it above rate. If you made a 2 2, that was actually above, that's actually basically above rate. So. Two of these cards, interestingly, are, or three of these cards, interestingly, are from uh, Modern Horizons, or straight to Modern sets, um, where Wizard seems more comfortable pushing the power level. We'll get on to five minute power level in a, a bit later, but it is something to note that those, that historically those sets have done, um, cards from those sets have done well. On to class two. These cards are not really five mana, but I've included them. I've included them for the sake of transparency because they are technically five mana. They're expensive signposts and commons. Cinder Slash Ravager um, specifically comes to mind as a card that was very, very rarely six mana. And even when you played it for six, it wasn't the worst thing on planet Earth. This it actually sort of was a five mana five five vigilance that dealt one to each creature opponent's control, so that was that was actually kind of it's kind of like a sneaky five mana whatever, but um, it was four mana sometimes, and that that whenever it was four mana, it was just a complete backbreaking card, and the ability the fact that its mana value could decrease um, was a significant part of the card. But we are including it as a as a strong card nonetheless. Similarly, Colossal Sky Turtle has three different modes on it, uh, one of which is a seven mana six five, but one of which is a two mana interactive spell. So, I did want to put the, these these cards with a little bit of a caveat. They are included. They are very strong. They are reasons to draft these colors, though again, whatever. Um, but they have a little bit of a um, a different design space than them being outright, you know, expensive signposts on commons. And now we get to this, the uh, the tier three, which are sort of the solid cards, but not really worth getting into a deck for. Examples are. You know, Bort aforementioned Bortuk, Bone Rattle, Emodi, Badlands Revival, Vivisection Evangelist, stuff like that. Um, and people are going to fight me over these. Uh, there's there's lots of defenders of these type of cards, um, and that's fine. You can be a defender of these type of cards. I think that even those people would tell you that you don't want to be first or second picking these type of cards. Um, where you could first pick a Cinder Slash Ravager, you could first pick a Colossal Sky Turtle, and it wouldn't be like a disaster. I think it's kind of a disaster if you're first picking an Emoti or a Bortuk Bone Rattle. Bortuk's a little bit different because that format was kind of a soup format, but its win rate indicates, based on its top player win rate, it actually indicates that it should be around here, um, which actually surprised me a little bit. I thought it would have performed better in the hands of top players, but it didn't really. Um, at, it's possible that at that stage of the format, the deck was a little bit overdrafted, domain that is, and uh, it was it was probably a little bit was probably fading towards the end of that format. But yeah, these are a lot of these are, are value cards. You'll see Make Your Own Luck, Master's Guide Mural is more of a value card, Badlands Revival is a value card, Emoti is a value card in some ways. Um, sort of the value stuff, or the or the very conditional stuff. Bortuk, Bone Rattle, and Dervisection Evangelist have strong conditions that you need to meet in order for them to do their thing. Similarly, Master's Guide Mural as well. So these are very these are more conditional cards they're not just good like some of the other stuff and that's why they're in tier three on to tier four the the, the card the tier that i have lovingly described as playable um these cards to me are cards you can put in your deck um they're not super exciting if you're taking them early you're probably making a mistake these are cards that almost without fail get overdrafted in whatever set they're they're in um they just do so these are these are cards that you know i don't tend to play a lot of 
I think you'll see that. Um, just just in general, they they're not essential to their deck being functional, and they are often a little bit below rate. A lot of these cards do not do anything when they enter the battlefield, um, or have very difficult restrictions. Naomi is an example of a card with difficult restrictions. Was that card playable? Absolutely. Is it a card you should be taking early? Absolutely not. So that's that's why that's kind of here. Same with Uchin, Uch, oh no, Uchbin Bach. Um, that card was a card that I played. I played some a decent amount of it, but I never took it early. I always was trying to wheel that card. If you're wheeling these cards, you can put them in your deck. If you're not wheeling these cards, it's a little bit more dubious whether or not you should play them. And finally, the unplayable tier. Now again, some of these cards people are going to be strong defenders of. There are Wrangler of the Damned fans out there. There are um, Storm Skrelix even. Some people like that card. Oh, Storm Skrelix was kind of bad. I don't know. Um, I have played Invasion of Lorwyn before. It wasn't good. Zaro Jan in a card, again, I have played. It wasn't great. Again, these are cards that underperformed in almost every statistical category, and the decks that they were a part of were bad, and they were extremely low picks, and if you put them in your deck, you probably, you're probably wrong putting them in your deck 70% of the time, if you did. Um, and again, there are going to be people that really like Wrangler with the Damned and stuff, and some of these cards people people are going to be fans of, that's fine. I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of a baseline for, for my feeling and, and sort of a general impression of my my tiers of five drops. And that's, that is all five of the tiers. Um, they are meant as sort of a general guideline to what a five drop, what what a class of five drops looks like. And with the tiers out of the way, we will now transition to discussing the problem at hand. And here we have reached problem number one, curve considerations. So the first aspect of the five minute signpost problem is, as we discussed at the beginning of this video, what does it look like when you're drafting a deck? And you just have an average distribution of cards. So here we see two mana spell, three mana spell, four mana spell, five, five six mana spell in our pile here. And then we have a card that we're probably not going to play, but we just it's not relevant to the pick we're making right now. And we get to five mana signpost and two drop. And even if this is a good mana five foot mana signpost, Star Starseer Mentor is not a top tier five mana signpost by any metric and all that. But even if this was one of the best five mana signposts, you're already kind of feeling a little bit of the heat here. You are already, like me personally, I would be thinking things like, man, I really feel like if I get my two drops locked in early, I can, I can have more flexibility later on in the draft. I can have, you know, when the power level, the the disparity in power level between two cards is higher, I can actually just take the better card and not have to worry about it. But here, we see the five mana signpost and we say, well, I think I'm going to have to pass. I think I'm going to have to genuinely pass on the card that is designed to be for my two colors for a two drop. And as much as that is a factor of, of modern limited in... in, in in its design, and not necessarily a fault of the five drop itself. It is something that is important to note, um, because when you're dra when you're going into drafting an archetype, you have to think about it's like down the road, these are picks that I might have to make. It's like these are the type of picks I might have to make if I'm going to draft this archetype. So it actually becomes more difficult to in the draft portion to draft a good black white deck in this in. Bloomboro compared to a green black deck because the green black signpost is two mana. Um, so, because when it, like if this was the green the green black signpost and you had green black start versus a five mana really good green or black card, you could just take the green man signpost. It solves all your problems. It's locking you into those two colors, which is what you kind of want to be doing. You want to, you know, whatever. For for those of you that enjoy sending signals, I am not really one of you, but there are people out there that believe in the theory of sending signals. It's a, it's, it's a good signal to take the, the two-color pair so that the, the people don't think that that two-color pair is open. If you're if you're a believer in that, which I am not. But for people that do believe in, believe in that philosophy, that is something to think about. Um, it's just, it's so much easier in spots like this to be like, oh, two-drop, slam it, take it. Or even like a three-drop or four-mana signpost. Like a four-mana signpost, even compared to five, is is less. There's a reason I cut I cut off at five and not four. Um, four has some similar problems, but five specifically is where 
you're not necessarily expected to hit those land drops on time every time, right? That's kind of where it starts to get sketchy. You're not you're not very very likely to do that every single game. So that's that's sort of the first thing to consider. The next problem is splash ability. More expensive spells are inherently easier to splash because of how splashing works. When you're splashing a color, you want to give yourself the most highest odds to have mana fixing of that color by the time you want to cast the spell. So splashing a one mana spell is generally not very good unless that spell is sorted to plowshares because you want to cast your one mana spells early in the game. Five mana spells on the other hand are much easier to splash because you can't cast them until turn five at the earliest which has given you at least four draws or four draws at an, a, um, a land to fix your mana as opposed to only having maybe one or two draws if you're splashing a three or a two drop. So it becomes much more likely that you're going to hit your mana on time to cast this card, and so there's a, a higher range of players in the draft that can take this. Of course, to kill is an ex excellent example of this, a very splashable card from Marisa Carla Manor, and I splashed this card and other people splashed it as well several times because it's just it's such a, such a powerful card and if you're just blue or black, you could easily pick up, you know, you only need to play three sources, especially with a five mana spell, you only need three sources, and you're just, you're getting a great card. And so the person that's blue-black, the blue-black drafter at the table, is kind of getting less equity than someone that has a two mana signpost, and that can't really be splashed as easily. Um, so other drafters at the table can't be like, well, I guess I'll move into these two, like, I guess I'll splash this two drop. It doesn't really work that way, unless it's a really, really, really push two drop, which does happen sometimes, but for the most part, it's it's not really great to be doing that. So this means that your expensive signposts are actually more difficult to get later in the draft, because, especially in formats with good fixing. In formats with bad fixing, it is a little bit less, uh, this is a little bit less true because people are splashing less. But even in those formats, if the card is powerful enough, people are going to take it early and splash it, and they're going to find a way. And like whether or not people's mana bases are good or not is not your problem in the draft, right? In the draft, you don't get to control whether your opponent is building a good mana base. If they want to take a card and try to splash it, and they don't know how to build a mana base, and like you get, you know, you're disadvantaged because your signpost didn't like come to come to you sixth pick when it would probably would have if the player knew how to build a good mana base, you're out of luck. Like that's just unfortunate for you. If people get over ambitious. It's easy to speculate on, on five mana cards where it's not so easy to speculate on cheap cards. Problem number three is card balance. And this is kind of a I want to caveat this problem by saying I have never professionally designed Magic the Gathering cards or any like game product. I have never done that, but what I can hypothesize as somebody that has played a lot of the game and who does, you know, has thought about, what if I wanted, like, what, what would it look like if I was to design whatever, something like this? Everybody's had these thoughts. In my mind, and it's possible this is completely incorrect and it's all just hearsay and false, but in my mind, as a designer, it's much more difficult to get five mana spells right than cheaper cards because by turn five so much of the game has taken place and based based on format context other format contexts the five drop may or may not be powerful enough to be impacting the game at that stage so it's much easier to miss on a five drop than it is a two drop with a two drop for the most part you just go okay each player has drawn a card and in some formats, like, we, we know we designed good one-drops in the set. Oh, there might be a one-drop in play, or there might not. That's kind of about it with two-drops. There's not a lot of variance there. You kind of know, like, you know what the limits are design-wise, and you kind of, like, you have an upper and lower bound that's clear. But with five-drops, the upper and lower bound for what the average game state looks like is so much broader. So it's really hard to thread that needle and be like, no, we want our card, our, our signpost to be exactly this powerful. So we are going to design it to do exactly this in this format. You can sort of get away with doing that with two and three mana spells, but with five mana spells, it's just, there's just too much going on. It's, 
With two and three mana spells, it's extremely likely that the person will be able to play them on turn two every single game, because you're not going to keep a hand without two lands in it, so you're going to be able to play two, your two drop, right? With five drops, if you don't hit your fifth land on turn five, you are not going to be able to cast your five drop on turn five all the time. And so you, it's like, should you design a card that makes up for that power level disparity of not being able to cast it every game on time, or should you not? And that's kind of a philosophical design question that's hard to answer. Typically, designers tend to err on the side of caution because there have been mistakes in the past with other cards and whatever, and it's it's generally better to miss a little bit low than to miss too high um, with expensive spells. Because if you miss high with an expensive spell, you can invalidate the entire game up to that point, and you can basically create a bomb uncommon that you, that you don't really want. And so there's sort of this inherent pull down on expensive spells. So it's, it's hard to design spells that thread that needle of, oh, it's impactful enough that it's good on rate. It's not too impactful that it just completely invalidates everything that happened before it. And it's also strong enough to make up for the fact that you can't cast it on time every game. And so with all of those extra design criteria in mind, it's certainly harder to get these right than it is to get a cheaper card right. And the final problem I wanted to talk about when it comes to draft strategy with five mana signposts is expensive cards in general are often taken by inexperienced players higher than they should. So, again, similar to the splashing problem, when you have a card, when you're a player and you're in a two-color deck and you're like, okay, all right, whatever, all these good things, if you, like if someone to your right sees an expensive signpost and thinks, oh, I can move in here. But you wouldn't do that because you know, oh, well, you know, it's too expensive. I probably should take a cheaper card. You may think that the deck is open because you're getting these cheap cards for your deck that fit very well. And you're like, oh, this is great. This is a good synergy piece. And then in like later on in the draft, you kind of are like, the person to my right ended up drafting this deck. How did this happen? I like they just took a five mana side like a really expensive card early in the draft when they shouldn't have done that, and now I'm I'm getting lost in the sauce. So again, this is sort of a arena best of one queue or whatever online only stuff. When you're in a competitive pod, competitive players aren't going to do this. You're going to generally get your five your more expensive spells later on in the pack, and you're going to be you you can actually read signals more easily in that way. On Arena, though, it's very difficult to read signals because they aren't necessarily people don't necessarily draft coherently all the time, and some people are just in it for the the rares and whatnot. Some people are just you know buy the the pass, the mastery pass, get the draft token, and go we. And that's fine. That's that is your right, by the way. That is I'm not I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. That's everybody lives life a little bit differently, and that's totally something you can do. Um, just not my speed. So. I would say that it's just the cards are going to be played and in statistical terms they're going to show up in decks where either they are drafted a little bit too high by somebody who is not as good at drafting and if they're not as good at drafting it means that generally they're not going to be as good at the gameplay portion as well. Um, so it means that they're going to have a little bit of a bias towards the negative in terms of who's actually playing with the cards. And it's just going to mean that the they're not they're going to underperform. They're going to underperform people's expectations. People are going to have bad experiences with the cards because they're taking them too highly. Um, they're going to sort of maybe over-index on what the, their five drop is trying to do. When you're building a deck, you kind of want to be indexing on what do my powerful cards do. And because... It, the signpost is supposed to be your, one of the more powerful cards in your deck. You're like, oh, I want to be doing what my five drops doing, but that means that your deck may not be like functioning on all cylinders until it gets into like until turn five. Whereas again, your green black deck is like, got my three two squirrel and now I'm rolling. You know, it's like I, my game plan is already off and running here on turn two. Whereas you, there be, there's more setup cost with the five drops. And uh, those are those are sort of the big key points, the big discussion points I wanted to go over today. And I will wrap this up shortly. So what are the key takeaways from this video? The biggest takeaway for me personally is that 
five mana signposts on commons are more desirable to a larger percentage of other people at a draft table than cheaper signposts on commons. This can be in the form of splashing. This can be in the form of just being powerful and being visually appealing to players that don't necessarily follow all the limited de like information. So up to date, you know what I mean? They're more appealing cards. They're more splashable. It's easier to justify taking them. If they, you know, if there's nothing else in the pack that you're interested in, you can always be like, oh, I'll take this, speculate on it, maybe I'll splash it, maybe I won't, all that stuff. So for those reasons, it is harder to get them later on in the pack. It is also difficult to design five mana signposts that thread the power level needle. So if cards are really powerful, they fall into the splashability problem where, oh, every deck just wants to try to splash this because it's so strong, and that means that the, the color pair that the deck is trying to support is inherently weakened, because its best card is just getting put in every other deck, because why would I put it in that color pair when I could just have a, have another signpost on common that's powerful and two mana, and then splash the five mana one of these other this other color, because it's a very powerful card, and it's easy to splash because it's more expensive, and a lot of these cards are single pipped. Um, so again, it's it's just it's much easier to splash than cheaper cards, and so they're just going to get taken from you more highly in the draft. So you're like getting fewer, on average, powerful cards for your deck later compared to other archetypes. And it's important to keep this in mind when you're getting into a color pair. So I mean, it's sort of like would be a back of the mind thing because you don't know what's going to be opened. But what you can always think about is if you're drafting a color pair in a set where, hey. You know, blue, black, and or MKM, for example. If you're drafting blue, black, and MKM, and you're, you kind of got to think to yourself, it's like, well, I'm going to have to take the coerce to kills really high because they're just not going to, I'm just not going to get them. Like, I'm not getting that equity of, like, even if it's open, I still am going to have to take that card high. Like, I can't ever really expect to wheel it. It's just too powerful and too splashable. So... I have to take this card higher than I would like to, even when I'm in the deck that like it should be best in, because it's just it's too easy for other decks to have access to the card. And with that, and with those considerations in mind, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion into the five mana signpost problems, reviewing what the five mana signpost have done in the past couple of years, talking about the good ones, talking about the bad ones, talking about why I think they're good and bad, talking about how what you can do to sort of be mindful of this going forward when it comes to evaluating cards or drafting cards or just kind of being informed about how how stuff works in limited and a little bit of an insight into my philosophy i hope you enjoyed and i'll see you next time